Is justice really blind? Or do we live in a two-tiered justice system that judges its citizens based on their gender rather than the crime they have committed? What is the penalty for a teacher who has sex with a student? In America, most schools have eliminated their sexual education courses as being too obtrusive into the lives of students. These classes were meant to prepare students for the eventuality of having sex. But there was no eventuality for them having sex with their own teachers. Tonight on Predator 101, we discuss a justice system based upon gender. We hire teachers to mold our children's minds and to keep the relationship with them above the belt and purely platonic. Most teachers can't find the time between creating a winning lesson plan and grading homework. But some find the time to have sex with their students. On this episode of Predator 101, we present for you three teachers who got parole for sexual relations with students. First up, Miss Emily L. Nesbitt, age 31 years, probation. Second, Miss Courtney Jarrell, age 23 years, probation. And lastly, Taylor Ivory Bono, 22 years old, probation. Although most newspaper and television news outlets choose to feature male teachers that have sex with their students, they end up missing the big picture. That picture is that the demographic makeup of the administration and the faculty of schools across America are mainly women. As the latest statistics, we have to go by in the digest of education statistics shows us that about 76% of public school teachers were female and 24% were made up of male in 2017-2018 school year, with a lower percentage of male teachers at the elementary school level than at the secondary school level. Now what does this mean? This means that any sexual assaults would also reflect those numbers by the sheer difference in those demographics. Statistics now show us that an increasing number of female teachers have been found sexually assaulting students. As is the case with male perpetrators, Female perpetrators uh, can be found assaulting men and women. Now, Doan Law tells us that the primary reason why more headlines are being made about female teachers molesting students is because in recent times, a focus, now, a focus has been placed on this type of criminal activity, where in the past that might have not have been so. For many years, the reality of female teachers sexually assaulting their students was hushed up or covered up completely. Like their male counterparts, female perpetrators of sexual assault in the education arena tend to target vulnerable male students as their prey. Their targets tend to be boys in the charge who may be socially isolated among their peers. So they're preying on that particular type child. Now they may also be boys who are having some sort of problem on the, at the home front. For example, their parents may have fairly recently divorced or apparently may even have died in a relatively recent past. And so that is what the teacher preys upon, a weakness. Another area of female teachers assaulting their students that remains quite in the dark are those situations in which the victimization involves girl students. Yes, not just boys, but girl students. The targets of these teachers do tend to be particularly vulnerable girls who are struggling with their own sexuality. There are also situations in which the targets of these teachers are girls struggling with their gender identity. So, just like the male teachers, it's a target. Now, as I mentioned previously, the matter of female teachers sexually victimizing students has been overlooked and underreported up until fairly recent times. So it's always been there, but just not reported. A main reason why this is the case is because of what can be prevailing cultural norm associated with male students who were the victims of sexual assault by their female teachers. So in essence, we just see it differently when a woman does it as opposed to a man. 
Now, another historic reality associated with female teachers who sexually assaulted their male students is found in the fact that boys oftentimes believe this type of victimization was considered a proverbial badge of honor in their eyes. It's something that society said a boy was lucky to receive this. As a consequence, boys rarely reported this type of victimization to anyone in a position of authority. At best, it was the talk of the locker room among their peers. But in a teaching profession that is dominated by women, there has been an increase in the number of female teachers who are prosecuted for sexually assaulting male students, maybe for the first time. With that said, a significant number of female teachers outed for sexually molesting students don't end up being charged with the crime, let alone making the news. Now, even in those instances in which a female teacher is charged and convicted for sexually molesting a student, the penalty imposed is minimal in many cases at best. Long jail sentences are not likely outcomes in a case in which a female teacher is convicted for sexually assaulting a student, which leads us to our first case. Remember I said convicted. The teacher who abused the public trust for the first case hails from Cumberland County, Pennsylvania. Before she was fired, Miss Emily Nesbitt was an 11th grade English teacher at Cumberland Valley High School before she abruptly resigned two days after her school officials learned of her alleged hookups. Now, her brazen daylight hookups she had with a student in her classroom during school hours, of course. Now, in order to save herself a long drawn out court appearance and her ego and some jail time by perjury, she pled guilty in Cumberland County Court of Common Pleas to institutional sexual assault. Listen to what I said. Institutional sexual assault. So for those of you who are confused about the definition of institutional sexual assault, let me explain. Institutional sexual assault is the identified in 18 Pennsylvania Consolidated Statute uh, Annotated Section 3124-2. Now under this legal statute, the crime is defined as a sexual contact between two people that have a specific relationship. You're watching MNN, the men's channel. Now, typically, one is in a position of power or authority over the other. In this particular case, Miss Emily L. Nesbitt was a person in that unique relationship who had all the power over the child. You get to see when it's a male. Now, Miss Nebbett was not found out about her crime because she came forward to clear her conscience. Oh no, it was me. Emily was found out in charge at the Silver Spring Township Police began an investigation into the allegation that she was involved in sexual misconduct with that particular student. Now, for this crime, the maximum penalty for the charge of this behavior is seven years in prison and up to $15,000 fine. However, Prosecutor Richard Badbury, who was the senior assistant district attorney, said the Commonwealth is recommending a probation sentence following extensive conversations with her victim and the victim's family. That doesn't matter. If this was a do straight to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Now, Ms. Nesbitt was, will also face between 15 to 25 years registration under the Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act. Police said school officials learned of the allegations after a female student reported seeing some racy texts on a cell phone of the boy involved in the case, and she brought it to the attention of the school. So before that, nobody noticed, I guess, right? Now at that time, both teacher and a student had to turn over their iPhones to the police for investigation. In the teen's phone, the teacher was listed as my lady. Now both devices contained racy photos as well as messages that discussed their hookups and plans for after school meetings. And at that point, school officials immediately notified police. Ms. Nesbitt was then placed on administrative leave that day and resigned her position two days later. In other words, she got out while the getting was good. She was not going to face any further uh, punishment than that. Ms. Nesbitt was subsequently arrested after turning herself in and was arraigned with bail set at $100,000 cash then released. Now here's what we know about this case thus far. The affidavit of probable cause said the student reported meeting with Miss Nesbitt a couple of times a week after the end of the school days, where she would hold hands with him and kissed him 
and was involved in sexual contact with this particular boy. The two also exchanged multiple text messages that discussed meeting in her classroom during and after school hours, exchanged photographs of each other in various states of undress, and where Nesbitt further discusses a desire, she said, to have sex with him. So this is your teacher. She may not be good at giving you grades, but she's good at giving you sex. Now this sexual uh, instrument she talked about implies that some sexual activity had already taken place between the two. Police said Nesbitt admitted to the relationship when she was interviewed. Her attorney had this to say about her. Perry said Nesbitt has undergone extensive treatment and made a series of very bad decisions and she now has to put these uh, pieces back together. This was a difficult case, he added. Emily is a young woman with kids of her own. So the consequences to Emily and her family are devastating. She's convicted felon. She will be on Megan's Law for 15 to 25 years and somehow she needs to figure out how to pick up the pieces. But in reporting for Predator 101, I would have to cut her lawyer off at this point and tell him that we hear this song and dance routine each and every time we do these cases. Each and every time a woman is caught and never before she's caught. Now I understand full well that it is his job to protect his client and not the public who needs protection from his client. The idea of probation in this case should have been highly unlikely due to the fact that Ms. Nesbeck was actually caught having sex with a student by another person in her classroom. Our second teacher of distinction, morals, and ethics who got probation comes to us from Riverton, Utah. Her name? Mrs. Courtney Jarrell. In this case, the judge who presided over the case said that he struggled mightily with what to do with the former Riverton High School teacher. Ms. Jarrell, before her termination, was accused of having sex with her female student. Now, instead of applying the law in this case, the judge seemed to be interested in applying his own brand of compassion based upon her gender. That's why this show is based upon gender. But compassion in these cases becomes the only form of acceptable misogyny that women who are charged prefer over the equality they fought so hard to achieve in getting those coveted positions. I'll take misogynist case for two points, thank you. So to hide behind one's gender when you get in trouble is the height of hypocrisy in an age of the fourth wave of feminism. The judge did note, on the other hand, that she was a teacher who became sexually involved with a student and that alone called for punishment. So he knew in this particular case that did cause for punishment. But did he do it? You're watching MNN, the men's channel. Now, on the other hand, he said everyone in this case, including prosecutors and the victim, were asking for a sentence of probation with, in, with no time behind bars. <laughs> Everyone involved seemed to think there should be no jail, he said, about this case. But Predator 101 asked the question, when do we ever listen to what people prefer when presiding over legal cases that are cut and dry and penalties already on the books in each particular city? Ultimately, the judge sentenced the 23-year-old woman to 18 months probation. He gave 100 hours of community service and a $900 fine. He sentenced her to one year of jail on each three counts of sexual battery, a class A misdemeanor, but suspended the jail time completely. Now the victim met Jarrell, who was also a basketball coach at the school at an open gym for potential basketball players. She said Jarrell wrote her note conveying her that she had feelings for the student. She testified that she was later at Jarrell's apartment where their contact eventually escalated to sex. Prosecutors did not believe they could show Jarrell use a position because she was neither the girl's teacher nor coach. But she understood full well that it was against the law to have sex with a student in that particular state. And that if that slipped her notice as an educator, she would also have noticed that the child was a minor. And she was originally charged with object rape, a first degree felony and forcible sexual abuse, a second degree felony. Now, the plea to misdemeanor counts allowed Jarrell to avoid having to register as a sex offender altogether. For those of you who are confused at this point with the Utah statute, here's the state's the definition of object rape. 
A person commits object rape of a child when the person causes a penetration or touching, however slight, of the genitalia or anal opening of the child who is under the age of 14 by any object or substance or instrument or device that includes a part of the human body. Now this is done with the intent to cause substantial emotional or bodily pain to the child or with the intent of arousal or to gratify for sexual desire. Now, just as in the first case, this teacher too was able to get away with the indecent liberties with the student through probation. <laughs> Finally, our last Teacher of the Year award goes to an educator from Beacon Falls. Beacon Falls is a township in West New Haven County of Connecticut. In this case, the former Conard High School teacher and track coach, Mrs. Taylor Boncow, is accused of having sex with a student in the most unusual of all these cases of leniency I have ever seen. She was granted a special form of probation that will result in the dismissal of all charges after she successfully completes probation. Now, that's amazing within itself. Now, what made the punishment more amazing was that it was determined at the inquiry before the judge. And Bonko had initially been charged with three counts of second degree sexual assault. Those charges were reduced to four degree sexual assault, a class A misdemeanor that carries a maximum sentence of one year in jail. <laughs> but did she get it? Did the teacher get it? No, sir. Superior Court Judge Joan K. Alexander granted Boncow accelerated rehabilitation and placed her on probation for two years only. Two years only probation. So not only do we have an outstanding teacher in that township, we have outstanding judges as well. <laughs> Former teacher Boncow have it was instructed to have no contact with the student and can't teach or have a job in which she has a supervisory role over any students or minors. Prosecutors did not object to Bonka receiving accelerated rehabilitation. Now, New Britain State Attorney Brian Perlowski uh, told the judge that by all accounts, Bonka did have a terrific job as a student teacher during the fall semester. He said she was so well that uh, she was hired as a coach for the school's track team. As she concluded student teaching, he said she had what he referred to as a consensual relationship with a male student who was not a member of the track team. There's no such thing as a consensual relationship with a student. Her lawyer, Eugene J. Rico, said Bon Cow acknowledges that she made a mistake and regrets the situation. But this female teacher knew what I am about to tell you right now, and that is that state law prohibits sexual contact between the school district employees and students in their school across the entire United States, period. No thing comes before that. Nothing. Period. For Predator 101, this is Charles Rivers. We thank you for watching.